four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Men are a great battlefield of that war, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I didn't write that. <laughs> That's some original beat poetry by Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> that was November 20, no, no, November 19th, 1863. I memorized that when I was nine. I memorized a lot of other stuff when I was nine as well, because my third grade teacher, Mrs. Kiner, perpetuated the myth that we use 10% of our brain. And spoiler alert, that is a myth. Advanced brain imaging technology tells us that most of our brain is engaged most of the time. Even when you're doing something mundane, like petting a cat. <laughs> choosing ranch dressing, you know that? <laughs> when I asked Miss Kiner, what would happen if we could use 100% of our brain? She didn't know, she's like, uh, superpowers? <laughs> So I became obsessed with unlocking 100% of my brain because I wanted to be a dark wizard! <laughs> I wanted to be able to summon demons to vanquish my enemies! I wanted to bring about the end times! I wanted to be able to see boobies whenever I wanted! <laughs> Typical nine-year-old bullshit, right? <laughs> So I became a voracious reader. I was at the library a lot, much to the chagrin of the librarians. Because I was this roly-poly, rosy-cheeked little fat kid with a big blonde fro and this stupid high voice. And I checked out the weirdest fucking books. <laughs> superpowers, I got weirder. <laughs> and if your goal is to get picked on less for being a nerd, bad fucking choice. <laughs> yeah. I am good at bar trivia now, though, so... <laughs> Cogitation pays off in gift cards, apparently. Yeah. But I do find the brain fascinating, which is a nice way of my brain telling you that it finds itself fascinating. <laughs> this is narcissistic, introspective, three pound lump of electrified fat that's right here, and that's where all the magic happens, just like in your skulls. It's not here, it's not here, it's right here. I Googled a lot of brain facts when I was doing this, when I was putting this set together. And the people also search for a box would pop up every time. <laughs> and in that box every time, it said, Why is the brain important? <laughs> you know, if you have to ask. <laughs> and keep in mind that those results are very heavily weighted. So that's not just one Alabama dumbass asking, Should I have brain? <laughs> brains all across the globe having existential crises. I mean, I don't know if it's even worth it anymore. We're just sitting around and watch Fox News and troll people on Twitter all day. I mean, Jesus, just put me out of my misery. Just take me out and fill your skull with jelly beans. I don't even care anymore. I do love them colorful beans! Maybe we should have some magic in the box, but it thanks first. So I went down that rabbit hole. I clicked on that link. <laughs> it brought me to a website of a New Jersey clinic called Princeton Brain and Spine. And this 
page leads off with the brain is arguably the most important organ in the body. Arguably. That tells me this is a place that does brain surgery, by the way. The brain of a brain surgeon came up with that line. Which tells me two things. The brain is the most important body part. Yes, more important than boobies. It's also clearly the most humble. You know the heart wouldn't be so humble. No, man, I run this shit. Look at me pumping. Look how pumped I am. Pumping blood all day. Look, pump, pump. If you didn't have me doing what I do, you'd be dead. You know? What I mean, you'd be fucking dead. The brain would agree. Absolutely, what you do is smash it. I love it. It's brilliant. I love that you keep me bathed in blood. Beautiful. As you mentioned, though, it would be disheartening to lose you. Which is why I've invented an artificial version of you. His name is Cyril. Would you like to meet him? <laughs> of all the reasons to find the brain fascinating, and there are many, my personal favorite is that the brain is, always has been, always will be, a big fat fucking liar. It's true. You can't trust your memories. And the reason for that is because of how the brain accesses the memories. These things aren't filed away. We're not going to talk dreams right now. These things aren't filed away very neatly like we're in the library. They're kind of like a jigsaw puzzle and you lost the box. That's just shit strewn about a maze. And so when you want to call up a memory, the brain's like, oh, let me get me out supplies and paint you a fucking picture. Is that what you want? And so that's what happens. The only problem is the brain is like Bob Ross. Very good at painting, but likes to add shit to paintings you think are done. Right? Here's your, here's your grandparents' house. You remember that? Remember the roof and the drainage ditch? And here's a happy tree that lives right here. Brain Bob Ross, they didn't have a tree in their in their yard. I don't know your it lives right here, they have it now. <laughs> now that you mention it, I guess, yeah, they had an oak tree. It's an elm. They had an elm tree. I probably climbed it. We're going to take our fan brush and our Prussian blue, and we're going to add a little childhood trauma in the corner. <laughs> Do you recognize your little cat? It's Mr. Shit Biscuit. He's right here. I didn't have a cat brain, Bob Ross, and if I did, I wouldn't name it Mr. Shit Biscuit because that's ridiculous. I'm gonna do a happy little car. Remember when that car ran him over? Remember how sad you were? She, her, actually, Mr. Shit Biscuit was a girl, and I cried for a month. What are you trying to do to me, brain, Bob Ross? But you can't trust your memories because every, the accuracy of every single memory you have will fail. It will degrade. And you don't have to believe me, but you can believe science, and you will. Even things you determine to be important, you'll forget. Here's an example. I don't know what's going on over there. I will choose to forget it. November 22nd, 1963. That is the date that John Fitzgerald Kennedy took a bullet to the brain. And at the same time, his heart was like, yeah, take that, motherfucker. <laughs> if you lived through that event, you likely have very vivid memories of where you were and what you were doing when you got the news. Those types of memories are called flashbulb memories. And they were, that was a term that was coined by two Harvard researchers in 1977, Roger Brown and James Kulik. They determined 
that these types of memories of significant events were like vivid photographs and they were more permanent than your run-of-the-mill dumbass shit memories. <laughs> Sadly, their research could have been a little bit more thorough. <coughs> Lazy! <coughs> but, luckily scientists are creepy. Science and tragedy, it's like peanut butter and bananas. Peanut butter and squid, I'm not here to judge what you eat peanut butter with. But the most serious recent work on flashbulb memories started just like three days after September 11th, 2001. Uh, two neuroscientists named Elizabeth something, and <laughs> I've forgotten. <laughs> Elizabeth Phelps and John Gabrielli, with the help of some other scientists all across the country, were able to survey 3,000 Americans about their memories of 9-11, which were fresh. And then, because science, they gave them the same, they gave the same people the same survey 11 months later, and then again 35 months later. What they found was that these memories, the accuracy of them, degraded just like any other memory. Up to 50% of the details were lost. But they were so vivid that the respondents refused to believe that they could have forgotten anything about that day. Because, you know, hashtag never forget. <laughs> hashtag you did. <laughs> Basically, your brain is a raccoon. You have a raccoon living in your skull. It's strong, it's smart, it's agile, it can solve problems, but it's also fat, it's full of shit, and it will fight you if you call it a liar. <laughs> leave you with a flashbulb memory of my own, one which the raccoon in my skull says is 100% true. I know where I was and what I was doing. January 28th, 1986. I was in sixth grade at Whitefield Elementary. Now, because Krista McAuliffe was about to become the first teacher in space, we were watching the shuttle launch live via satellite. About 70 seconds into launch, Roger go with throttle up. <laughs> Shuttle is engulfed in flames, Challenger breaks apart, all seven astronauts die. That caught everybody in the room a little bit by surprise. So the teacher panicked and turned off the TV. The teacher's name was Larry Teeling. The way, best way I can describe Mr. Teeling to you, imagine if Brian Dennehy and an elephant carcass had a baby. <laughs> That baby was roughly 65 years old, and it hated children. <laughs> so this picture of warmth, empathy, and compassion decided that we needed to talk about what we just saw. <laughs> children, we have all witnessed a traumatic event. It won't do to bottle up your emotion. You need like to talk about it, and I am here to help. Please tell me how you feel. Newsflash, nobody was ready to talk. Especially not to Mr. Teelin. He had already made three kids break down crying in class during that school year. One of those kids may or may not have been me. <laughs> and that was just over dumb math problems. This was some serious shit. So we were all very silent and very still. Well, not all of us. One hand, one grubby little hand, slowly went up in the back of the class. You would have to know Jack Ashby to know that some shit was about to go down. <laughs> Apparently, Mr. Teeling was the only one who didn't know. <laughs> he calls on Jack. Eyes widen. Butts pucker. <laughs> Jack speaks with great emotion and sincerity, I might add. Mr. Teeling? Why couldn't you have been the first teacher in space? 